When you go into a a car park at a post at a um, airport, they often give you a ticket and they say to you, any damage done to your vehicle within this particular premises is your responsibility, nothing to do with us. And of course you realise that in actual fact uh, you might come back and find your vehicle a little bit different than the way you left it. The reason why I say I start with a disclaimer is the fact that I think I now join with every speaker in this particular auditorium at this time who's ever spoken about the Lord Jesus Christ, who's ever wondered about what they've said, who sat down after they have spoken and thought, I could have done that so much better. The topic is something I did not do justice to. And then you think about it, how can you do justice to the brilliance and the genius of the Lord Jesus Christ? We are mere mortals. We try. And during the process of this week, that's exactly what I'm going to try with the Lord Jesus Christ. But we will never succeed. And I think any brother who has given a talk about the Lord Jesus Christ and sits down and feels self-satisfied has misjudged what he has said. You cannot do justice to the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, as I said this week, as we go through some of those interactions which the Lord Jesus Christ had with those around us, I want you to think and bear with me as I struggle with that same sort of predicament of coming up with those things which I should say about the Lord Jesus Christ. We'll get back to the right slide to start with. And I just might add at this stage that my history as a teacher of boys has taught me something very simple, that males are visual learners. And because we are visual learners, therefore something, have, something up in front of us as males is a very good idea. And so I apologise to the sisters in the audience <laughs> as we go through this, because um, as I said, I'm basically doing this for the brethren. <laughs> okay. So let's start with the background as far as the Lord Jesus Christ is concerned. We know that Israel was at this time an occupied nation, and it had been for a considerable period of time. It was contro controlled by the Romans, and the Romans had this iron fist. They controlled countries to the nth degree. The areas which were still under the, if you like, the leadership of a king were the descendants of Herod the Great, that evil, evil king in the time of the Lord Jesus Christ during his birth. How can you be so cruel as to kill all the children under the age of two years of age. What merciless man this really was. And yet his descendants were still there on the thrones of those various parts of Israel at the time of the Lord Jesus Christ. It was a politically unstable area. It had a long history of instability. The Maccabees, the Hasmodean dynasty and the destruction of that by the Romans as well. This was always bubbling just below the surface as far as this particular part of the Roman frontier was concerned. And that's what it was. It was the Roman frontier. You look at the extent of the Roman Empire. It did not go far past Judea. It did not go far past Israel at this time. And therefore, it had to be controlled. Herod the Great had been set up as a puppet from the Romans, by the Romans, hadn't he, in 37 AD. But that nationalistic fervour remained strong in Israel. Who was Simon the Zealot? What was a zealot? And of course the assumption is that a zealot was somebody who was still fighting for the nationalistic fervour, which is round in Israel at the time. Barabbas, it has been suggested, was not just a murderer or a thief, but he was also one of these people who was interested as well in nationalistic insurrection, in the re-establishment of the state of Israel in those times. But as I said, this part of the world was a Roman frontier. And so we had those sections of this particular country as it was in those times. Galilee, Samaria, Decapolis, Perea and Judea. All names which are familiar to us as Bible students as we look at the way in which this area was controlled. But overriding all of this was something called Pax Romana, the Roman peace. And the Roman peace was so useful, wasn't it, for the Lord Jesus Christ? The Roman peace was so useful for the Apostle Paul. It meant that he could travel through that entire Roman Empire and have a pretty 
safe chance that he was going to arrive at his destination because, well, the Romans were known, weren't they, for suppressing anybody who would do the wrong thing against their peace. And so, therefore, this was something which was beneficial as far as the Lord Jesus Christ was concerned and as far as the apostles were concerned later on as well. We've always got to remember that God does nothing by chance. This was a political situation that God had decided to plant his son in. There were things which were operating in his political sphere at this time, which God obviously saw as advantageous to the spreading of his word. And therefore, it was the time and the place. And we read in Luke about the fact that there was this expectation around that something was up, something was going to happen, that God was really going to move and a saviour was going to appear. And so looking at this instable, or unstable I should rather say, political situation at the time of Rome, we've got to realise that there were jurisdictions through which the Lord Jesus Christ passed during his preaching time. Herod Philip II, Tetrarch of Ituria uh, and Trachonitis. Here he is in this northern part, controlling this northern part of it, that area of Israel at the time. He was known as a wise and a good ruler. Surprisingly enough, in those times. Herod Antipas, Tetrarch of Galilee and Perea. Jesus spent a lot of time in his territory, didn't he? The second husband of Herodias, and we've heard of that. He puts John the Baptist to death. Pilate sends him to him. And of course, remember that after that little meeting between Jesus and Herod Antipas, there was more harmony between the Roman Tetrarch, or the Roman controller, the procurator, and um, Herod Antipas after that. Jesus calls him the fox. What do you call some a fox? Well, you think of them conniving, sneaky, political people who really haven't got too many scruples, that they're there to achieve their own goals and they're to feather their own nest. And then finally we have this area to the south, the area originally of Herod Archelaus, who was an ethnarch. Notice the terminology at Tetrarch, I've put down the bottom right hand corner there, who was a ruler of a quarter of a region, hence the word Tetrarch. And then we've got now this other word creeping in, ethnarch, who was the ruler of a common ethnic group, and this southern area, which became a part of the jurisdiction of the Roman procurator, Pontius Pilate, the, the most famous of all. He was, in actual fact, historically the fifth procurator of this area to the south of Israel, controlling this area of Samaria and the Samaritans and controlling the area of, of course, immediately around Jerusalem. And it is all inter interesting to notice that as Jesus passed in and out of these political jurisdictions, he would fall more or less under the influence of that great Sanhedrin in Jerusalem. And as he geographically got closer to Jerusalem, so their influence and control and power would grow greater and greater and greater. But up in Galilee, up in Perea, there was not that much control as far as that Jerusalem Sanhedrin is concerned. And so Jesus was certainly safer when he was in those areas as to those areas when he travelled south to Jerusalem, which he felt he had to, and he had to on those occasions of the feast. And all during this time of the ministry of those three plus years of Lord Jesus Christ, who is in control in Rome? One emperor, the emperor Tiberius. And of course we can see how the, these controllers, these tetrarchs like to curry favour the Sea of Tiberius, the city of Tiberius, Julia. We name things after them. And in doing so, we become more popular with, of course, in this case, the emperor in Rome. But there was stability in Rome in this time. Titus, of course, comes later. Those other issues come later. But there was stability in Rome. But still, as I said, this bubbling discontent in Israel, all the while while the Lord Jesus Christ was preaching. And you can just imagine, as in the times later on, we had mention of Martin Luther the other time, Martin Luther, he came to prominence at a time when there was this desire to mix social and religious reform. 
an unofficial fact. You may know that Martin Luther at one stage really had to reject that and wrote books to try and separate himself from social reform because he was seen as a religious, inform, religious reformer, as a social reformer. And that same thing occurred with Jesus, didn't it? He was a religious reformer. He wanted to take the people back to God. But what did the people see him as? They saw him as a social reformer. They saw him as a king. They saw him as somebody who would lead a revolt against the Roman overlords. And he had to fight against that as well to make it clear that there is a difference between political reform and religious reform. And he was not in that area. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight. And that's very famous words come down to us to this day. So again, we've got to realise the difficulty that Jesus had to contend with as he fought that sort of feeling among the people he, pre he preached to and taught to convince them that he was about their reform, not about the country's reform, not about the political reform, not about overthrowing the Roman overlords of the time. So, have you ever sat in an exhortation and thought to yourself, I wonder what it really would have been like to have been there? When Jesus got up and preached... What I felt like, how far would I have been prepared to travel to listen to this preacher, listen to this rabbi? And I think we listen sometimes. And one of the things which I'm among you may live looking forward to is actually hearing the words of Lord Jesus Christ being put under his spell in a way. Because obviously the way he spoke. And this is the way I wish to end this morning with more reference to this. The way he spoke just completely entranced his population. It, the people just were captivated by what he said. And I'm just wondering what it takes to captivate my mind to the degree that the Lord Jesus Christ was able to do back in those times. So we look at the Gospels and we marvel at them. And I'm wondering too, is as a a speaker in some cases in this room, do you ever try and directly copy what the Lord Jesus Christ did, the way he preached? Do you try and do the same things he did, the way he did it, and therefore <coughs> convey his message or convey the message in a, in a better way? Because he truly was, if I use the expression, the man for all seasons. And when I was a, a young man, I read the book and I thought to myself, yes, this was a book by Robert Bolt, or a play by Robert Bolt, but it doesn't describe the Lord Jesus Christ because he really, truly was the man for all seasons. Because really, when you think about it, it was the king coming to visit his kingdom. He was on earth. And while he was on earth, in a sense, the kingdom of God was on earth as well. We're not talking about the theocracies of the Old Testament, are we? We're talking about, in a very practical sense, when he was on earth, going around preaching and teaching, the kingdom of God was with them. And on one occasion, and it comes in, uh, through in the passage in Luke, and this was um, at the raising of the widow's son in Nain. They said to everybody around, they said, God has visited his people. <clears throat> because God had shown them through his son that there was a dead person, the widow's son, being carried out of that village and he was resurrected. He was brought back to life in a very real and tangible sense. And in that way, the kingdom of God was on earth because the king was with them. I'm still trying to get rid of this. I apologise, but uh, I'll keep, keep feeling. So, when we look at the multitude as far as the Lord Jesus Christ were concerned, who were they? Well, we know that Jesus' preaching appealed to a very wide range of people. First of all, we're told in Matthew chapter 4 about the sick who were brought along. And you can just imagine if you were in any way experiencing any sort of ailment in Israel at that time, and you heard about the Lord Jesus Christ, you would make a beeline for him. 
If you could be carried, you'd be carried. If you could in any way make sure that you got there, you would have been there. And you would have been there as soon as you possibly could. I'm sure there would have been the sceptics there as well. Those who came along and thought, oh, I've heard all about this. I wonder if it's true. And so they would stand in the audience and they would see the Lord Jesus Christ healing. And they'd think, you know, remember the account which is given to us, the man who was born blind? And remember the inquiry which took place by the Pharisees after that? The scepticism of those Pharisees. Is this the same person? I suppose when you've been blind from birth and you've all of a sudden got eyes and you're looking around and a very different... You would look very different, wouldn't you? And so people were sceptically saying, well, we've heard about him being a very good healer, but did he set this up in some way? Have his disciples contrived to produce somebody who looks the same or in some way bears resemblance and in that way fooling the audiences? And I'm said, I was... We would have had our few doubting Thomases, I think, in that audience who would be along. And I'm sure one of them, one more than one of us would be along with that same sort of thought in the back of our mind. He says he does it, but does he really? And so you get the sick and the ill, but you also get the sceptics. You also get those who want to come along and see if it was really as true as they said it was. And then the Pharisees and the teachers of the law from Jerusalem. I'm going to get a bit of on my soapbox here. Because I've been to a lot of Christadelphian talks and exhortations and lectures over my years as an old man now. And I must confess that I've heard a lot of Pharisee bashing. It's something which commonly occurs, doesn't it? We, we get Matthew 23 read and those seven woes and oh, we get those exhorters getting up and they really have a go at the Pharisees. Quite rightly so. The Lord Jesus Christ did, didn't he? But on the other hand, Let's not forget that those Pharisees, particularly early in the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ, I think had a genuine inquiry going on. This man Jesus, his doctrine doesn't seem to be that different to ours, does it? Certainly not Sadducees, more Pharisees. Let's go along and listen to him. And let's go along and see if we can in some way convince him that really he is a Pharisee all along. And therefore he's on side and therefore we can do these sort of things with him. And I think we can see in the early passages of the Pharisees coming along and listening to Jesus that willingness to want to perhaps work with him. Nicodemus, which I'm, who I'm going to speak about tomorrow, I think illustrates that. There was a group of Pharisees who were already starting to think, ah, this is a rabbi from God. Can we work with him? And I think you can find, as I said, that going on. But also in relation to those Pharisees, let's not forget who warned the Lord Jesus Christ about the fox. Yeah, it was the Pharisees. Who invited him on several occasions we know of into their home? The Pharisees. Who does the Lord Jesus Christ condemn for they know not the scriptures? Mm, That's not Pharisees, is it? They're the Sadducees. And what does the Lord Jesus Christ say about the Pharisees? Do as they say, but don't do as they do. And I think we can also see, as I said, the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ, how those Pharisees come along and they want to listen, they want to hear, they want to know. Yes, I know the attitude changes, the attitude hardens, and we get that reaction in the end which is terrible from the Pharisees. But I would suggest to you a lot of the audience in some of those early days of ministration of the Lord Jesus Christ were Pharisees who had a genuine interest to come along and listen to the Lord Jesus Christ and to find out how similar to their line of belief and doctrine he really was. Of course, they came along with the Sadducees looking for a sign, whatever sign that they had set up in their mind. And again, I've heard quite a few exhortations where the brothers got up and said, well, the Pharisees were looking for that sign. And as soon as they saw that sign, they'd accept the Lord Jesus Christ. And again, as said, there have been various suggestions as to what that sign could have been. But to look for that, they have to be there. And so again, I think we can say that the Pharisees especially would have been in those audiences. Children, we know, were brought to him. He was famous. If you're a parent and you know that there's a famous person lurking in your neighbourhood... 
you would like to take the kids? And, oh, I had seen so-and-so. And I think that was there as well, that their parents really did think that this particular person was worth showing to their children. Tax collectors and sinners, we know, were brought to him or came to him as well. Greeks, maybe other ethnic groups as well. This one we know of in John chapter 12, where the Greeks came <coughs> through Philip to try and meet the Lord Jesus Christ. We know that his fame was starting to spread outside <coughs> the parameters of Israel. They know, we know that there was a, a de definite thirst for knowledge in this society. And so you can just imagine people drifting in from other ethnic groups as well, just to catch a glimpse, just to listen to what this Lord Jesus Christ, this person was saying. And so we go to passages like Mark chapter 3, verses 7, where we have actually a geographical description of where the people come from. And we find listed there Galilee. Well, that's pretty predictable, isn't it? That's where he was as well. They came from Galilee. They came from Judea. Oh, that's going a little bit further. They're coming from Jerusalem. They're coming from Idumea. That's even south of Jerusalem. These people have travelled a long way. Perea, east of Jordan, Tyre and Sidon. They're coming from all over. And I think at certain stages, and I'll mention this briefly later on, they've got a better opportunity to come to listen to him too because things have fallen into place in other respects as well. Well, if you were planning some sort of um, preaching tour of Israel, I don't think you'd actually choose that route, would you? <laughs> it really looks like a bit like a dog's breakfast, doesn't it? And yet this is the suggested route which the Lord Jesus Christ took in Galilee and in Jerusalem, around Jerusalem. Now, it could be inaccurate, it could be wrong. But on the other hand, I think it does give us this idea that the Lord Jesus Christ travelled under the influence of the Spirit to where he was going to be heard by the majority, by the maximum number of people he could. This isn't random chance. This is, oh, let's go across there. I feel like it tomorrow. Oh, I hear the weather's good across the road of Korea. No, this was nothing to do with this at all. It was the fact that he went to those places. And when you think about the crowds that he was attracting, how does he fit them into a city? I'm sure the local Roman authority wouldn't have said, oh, well, you know, take over the amphitheatre for the weekend, if you like, and have your preaching campaign. No, he wasn't going to get that, was he? He was going to be in a situation where the people would have to come to him. Because wherever he went to them in the cities, it was going to be basically, physically, very limiting factor. And so I think we see in many of those particular travels the fact that he got close to places. And being that close to people, they came to him, they listened to him, and he was able to find a suitable geographic location. And you do wonder how he projected his voice too, don't you? He must have been wonderful at that, projecting his voice. But anyway, again, was it a miracle that so many people could hear him? And I would suggest it was on all occasions, because there were just so many untold miracles, I think, in the life and the preaching of the Lord Jesus Christ. Things which were <coughs> taken for granted. You know, it's always happened. We always found the right location. He always spoke and said the right thing. People always listened to him and heard everybody he said. And when they went too long, he even fed them. So everything seemed to fall into place so wonderfully as far as these missionary journeys were concerned. It is interesting, isn't it, that the people came to Jesus and yet Jesus sent his disciples to the people and they travelled from village to village to village to village because he realised that the numbers involved with the preaching as far as the disciples were concerned would not be the numbers which would be involved because of them coming to him and he had to find the venues which were suitable for them to come to him. Now I'm not going to argue about the nth degree of accuracy of this particular slide but I thought I'd use it today to try and illustrate some of the aspects as far as the Lord Jesus Christ's preaching and teaching. When you're putting together anything like this in relation to the Lord Jesus Christ, it is difficult because of the chronology. You're never 100% sure when the different things in the life of Jesus, when the very different events actually <laughs> occurred. And of course, you pick up a Bible commentator and they always disagree with another Bible commentator and disagrees with a third one. There's no uniformity there at all. 
And so you end up, in some cases, more confused when you start. But anyway, we've got this situation here where what we've done is we, or well, what they've tried to do is to put in context the various, the various um, gospels of, of the writings. And so you have in an orange and brown in colour, Matthew, you have Mark, you have John, and you have Luke. And it's interesting, isn't it, to see how you have overlap, overlap, so much overlap in the synoptic gospels. And you think to yourself, okay, well that might make it a little bit easier, easier to put the chronology. Because it is important to know the chronology to some degree, because the Lord Jesus Christ responds to his audience, doesn't he? He doesn't just get up like I'm getting up today and say, I've got this all prepared, therefore you're going to get it whether you like it or not. That's not the sort of speaker the Lord Jesus Christ was, was he? He was one who was infinitely flexible. He knew his audience, he saw his audience, and he tailored what he said to the occasion. And therefore, if he saw a particular group of people who might be the local farmers, I'm sure he responded to it. You also wonder how many times the Lord Jesus Christ repeated things. I don't think he got up and gave the Sermon on the Mount once. I don't think we're told that at all. I think there were many occasions when he thought, this is what they, this is my manifesto. And therefore, they need to hear it. Because they didn't hear it. Because the last time I used it was 50 kilometres away and they probably never heard of it. So this repetition. But nonetheless, the repetition was in a way which was suited to the group. Now, he was an orator par excellence. There's no doubt about it. His recall, his knowledge of Old Testament scripture was beyond comparison. He was one of them. As I said, he was, in every sense of the term, a genius. He was the great look, he was the greatest genius this world has ever seen or ever will see. And so when he looked at the audience, he would tailor what he said for the audience. He also had another advantage, he could read their mind probably too, and say, okay, that's this is what they need. And so whack, there he went in relation to this particular um, exposition which he was going to give on this occasion. So as I said, it is important if we can put things in context and say, okay, this was the parable he said for this reason because he was speaking there or because he was there in that part of Israel at the time. And therefore, it starts to make more sense as to what he said, the way he said it, and if he had to repeat himself a few times as well. But the one thing I find quite interesting about this, as I've got older and older and older, I've gone more and more to John. I don't know if any other brethren in here and sisters in here have actually found that as the years go by, they, they tend to find that they spend more time in John and less in the other Gospels. And I've wondered why. But anyway, one of the things which of course shows quite clearly here is the fact that John seems to be, doesn't he, the Gospel who fills in the gaps. And perhaps we can say that because if we look at the timing Matthew written, so the suggestion is, around about 58 to 59 AD. Mark written about 55 AD. Luke written about 62 AD. And John written sometime towards the end of the century. Believe it or not, that says it just down here. I'm not making it up on the spot. The point being, as I said, we've got this revelation continuing over time. And you can understand why too. When Jesus was alive, I can imagine there'd be a lot of people who would write their own Gospels. Who would say, I remember when, and they'd talk about, you imagine Bible classes after the death of the Lord Jesus Christ, resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, and all these people who'd been there would get together, remember when, and they'd combine their experiences, and they'd remember collectively all these things about the Lord Jesus Christ. And oh, this was just so wonderful, and the uplifting that that would be. But unfortunately, of course, time moves on, doesn't it? And then you get brother so-and-so died and sister so-and-so died. And so the first-hand knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ and what he said and how he said it, and sometimes that's very important, how he says things and the body language he uses, all that's going and so we get to the situation with the Apostle John. I'm sure he says, OK, we're now losing contact. Our primary data is going. We've now got to put more on paper. So therefore, the succeeding generations 
will also be informed about the Lord Jesus. And then, of course, we get that lovely little verse, don't we, at the end of John. About, I can't write enough. I've written the gospel, but it, it just doesn't seem to be adequate. All the books in the world could not contain what the Lord Jesus Christ said and did on earth. And so, therefore, here is my humble submission under the Spirit. And he gives it to us and prosperity, prosperity for us to remember. But anyway, as far as this is concerned as well, there are some tags, aren't there, given at the top of the slide there as to the three years of the Lord Jesus Christ. And they're trying to encapsulate what was characteristic of that particular time period. So it's about the topic of obscurity, that first year when he was relatively obscure. The second year, getting more and more popular. The third year, uh -oh, the opposition because coming because he is too popular. And then, of course, that last few months when things got very, very difficult for the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, where it all began. Let's very quickly now go through some of those things in relation to the multitude. <coughs> the Lord Jesus Christ seems to have a quite a structured beginning to his preaching career. He did what many other rabbis would have done. He taught in synagogues because he would have been invited to speak at the synagogues. And therefore he took up the invitation. Of course he took up the invitation. He was brought up in Nazareth. Well, go back to Nazareth. It's a good point of starting point, almost as any. And so we have the record which is there. I want to quickly look at that. Oh, we had it read, I know, as our introductory reading. But let's have a look, not from the reading of Matthew, but let's have a look at the parallel version, which occurs in Luke, where we get a little bit more detail about the events which occur on this particular occasion in the synagogue at Nazareth. And in Luke and chapter 4, and reading there at verses 16 to 19. And by the way, I will be using the ESV. Okay, so Luke chapter 4 and verse 16. And Jesus came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and he stood up to read. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll, and he found the place where it was written. And so we have this quotation. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor, he has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. Well, we can just imagine. In verse 20, he rolls up the scroll and gives it back to the attendant and sits down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. Wow. Quotation from, of course, Isaiah 61 verses. Well, well, it's not an exact quotation, but it's pretty close. And now they were having a quotation taken from the Old Testament, from the prophet Isaiah, and they were told virtually by what Jesus said, it's been fulfilled here in your sight. <coughs> and they were supposed to get that. And they were supposed to understand it. Well, we read on and we find out initially their reception was very good. But after that, they changed their mind because it appeared, didn't it? The Lord Jesus Christ was saying, well, you and Nazareth kept no favours. And this famous quotation, a prophet is not without honour, save in his own country. And so therefore, in the end of all this, what do they want to do? Well, they try to kill their Messiah. They take him to the brow of the hill and they're going to throw him over, which apparently was the way they stoned people, because apparently back in those days sometimes you had a convenient press of bush, you'd push him over and they would lie at the bottom, you stoned to death. But it was a way of disposing of them very, very quickly indeed. Now, if you or I were in a situation as speakers, and we got up and we'd spoken at some town hall somewhere and we'd got this sort of reception. I just imagine one or two of us must be, might be a little bit downcast. A little bit, shall we say, miffed by it all. 
a little bit upset, a little bit questioning and saying, hmm, perhaps this isn't my vocation after all. Perhaps I should look for a better day job. But this is not the Lord Jesus Christ, is it? Lord Jesus, he seems to be strengthened when things go wrong. He seems to, what's the expression, roll with punches? He seems to grow and be not phased by it. And this again is the example, this is the exhortation, this is the where what we learn from the Lord Jesus Christ. Do not be disheartened. If your own people turn against you, don't give up. It's what happened to him. If he's your master, it, it happens to you. Accept the fact that it's going to happen to you and react in the same way that your master does. And that's, I think, something which we've really got to take on board. It is our job to preach. It is our duty to spread the news. We should not, and we will not, get always the reaction we want. And we can't say, oh, it wasn't the reaction we wanted, so therefore God wasn't obviously in it. God was in the Lord Jesus Christ going to Nazareth. God was in the situation where he was nearly stoned to death. What it shows is a strength of character which we can only see exemplified to this degree in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so he goes through now those years of preaching. Taught these multitudes, these crowds for over three years. And over that time period as I got there, the reaction of the crowd changed, but his fame certainly spread. And I was interested, and I put this up on the screen too, because, again, when you try and put the chronology in the, in the years of the Lord Jesus Christ preaching, you do find certain trends occurring, I would suggest. And you can see some things there, for example, in what is believed to be his first year of preaching, which occurred significant things. Cleanses the temple for the first time, anyway. Discussion with Nicodemus, the Samaritan woman, and the discussion he had there. Heals the official son in Cana and so on. It seems to be that there's a, a lot of establishment of the preaching of Lord Jesus Christ. Putting the ground rules in place, if you like, and a little bit of emphasis on, from time to time on the healing and the miracles, but a lot about the preaching, a lot about the teaching, and a lot about his Messiahhood and what they should expect from him. And as I've got there at the end, also, he takes the first year he's already, already rejected. But who's, I mean, we go back in the Old Testament, we find quite a few Moses rejected. We, I mean, just typical of what they did to any prophet, of course, of times past. And Jesus got the same. The year of popularity. And I would suggest to what, what we see here is, is the, some of the miracles being upgraded almost. We've got resurrection going on in this second year of the preaching. We've got raising of Jairus' daughter. We've got raising of the widow's son, as I referred to earlier in Nain. We've got not only that, we've got the Lord Jesus Christ establishing his supremacy over nature. When we think about these things, you know, it just every now and again it's said we just can overlook some of the miracles. For example, when Jesus calms a storm, how do you do that? I mean, what laws of physics do you have to break to turn a raging Mountains of water around you into dead calm within just seconds. How do you do that? The Lord Jesus Christ just did it like that. That is just not just a miracle. That is a long, that's a really big miracle. And yet when the disciples saw it, they got hardened into it, didn't they? We're seeing these things every day. This is just one of the, you know, one of these things which keeps on going as far as that's concerned. But the Lord Jesus Christ is establishing the fact he can raise the dead, he can heal, whatever. He has power over nature. He is in total control. And I think in this second year, the disciples are supposed to see that there is nothing, there is nothing that their master cannot do. And we go on in year three and the mounting opposition, which I suggest now is a time period when doctrine and teaching becomes much more important. Because... He's starting to prophesy his own death. He's transfigured. And he heals again and raises to life. Isn't it interesting, just in passing, I'm going to mention this a little bit more about this later, later, later talk. But John is the only one who 
mentions a raising of Lazarus. Never noticed that. When I sort of start thinking about it, like, goodness me, this is one of the most significant, to me anyway, miracles of the whole of his time. And yet it only crops up in John. And you think, what, what would Matthew and Mark and Luke doing to leave it out? Is it? And then Kate waits for John and he comes along. Not only does, of course, he mention it, but he gets the most detail of any raising or any miracle of the Lord Jesus Christ of any of them. In actual fact, all of those miracles which are mentioned by John do get quite a lot of detail, which is almost passed over in the other Gospels. But those last few months, don't they? They become an inquisition. Wherever he goes, whatever he does, there's people watching. How can we trick him in his own words? And they, I'm sure they get all the erudite gentlemen or erudite professors in the Pharisees and Sadducees and they have these conferences probably night after night burning them wheat into the candles and the wee small hours of the morning trying to come up with some tricky questions which will get him for sure. And then, of course, nothing got him for sure because they did not appreciate the fact that they were dealing with genius and they were never going to, never going to trick him in his own words. But we do find, don't we, passages like Matthew 23, where the Lord Jesus Christ is fed up with them. He's had enough. These Pharisees had a chance to change. Some of them did. But these other ones have been a hard core. And this hard core is never going to change. And therefore, what he has to do to them is to tell them what they really are and call a spade a spade. Well, when people went along to listen to the Lord Jesus Christ, what did they expect to hear? In those times, if you made a journey of, say, of 30, 40, 50, 100 kilometres to listen to the Lord Jesus Christ, and you were walking along and you were thinking, I wonder what I'm going to get when I get there. What am I going to hear? Well, I wonder what you'd have thought. Well, the Lord Jesus Christ asked the same question about John the Baptist. When you went out to listen to him, what did you think you were going to get? And he draws a few conclusions. He said, well, OK, you're going to hear somebody who's very definite in his teaching and he's not going to be swayed by any human opinion. You also saw a true prophet because his words were from God. But, you know, of course, with the, um, John the Baptist, there were no miracles, were there? He was all preaching and teaching and condemning those who needed condemnation. Parallels with Jesus come through, but they're amplified, don't they? When he says of himself... There is someone greater than Solomon here. Wow, that's a big claim, isn't it? Solomon, someone revered so much in that society as a wise man of all, man, wise man of all time. And here is Jesus getting up and saying, well, I'm greater than him. You've got to believe that. You've got to believe it. It's not optional. And therefore, he was telling them of his importance. But he's... Famous bread because he acquired a reputation for being, as it says there in Matthew 7, speaking with authority. The word exosia, translated authority, power, control, or right, especially about moral things. So in other words, when you went along to the Lord Jesus Christ, what you expected to have was somebody who, when they said it, you knew that they absolutely meant it. You knew it was right in every sense of the term right. People use that as a bit of a rubbery word now, don't they? Right in my eyes. No. As we heard last night, there are universal truths. And Jesus was going to give you those universal truths. And he was saying, accept it. There is no question here. I don't have to refer to someone so and so. Well, you know, Rabbi so and so also agrees with me, and so does Rabbi so and so. And therefore, probably I've got the consensus behind me, therefore you can believe me. No, there was none of that. I have said it, the Lord Jesus Christ says, I am from God, therefore it is a universal truth. It is right. And I think that's what people really liked about him. There was no doubt, there was no questioning, there was no rubberiness about it. Because he was speaking universal truths. And as I've gone through there in the next dot point, they expected in the end to be amazed, astonished, astounded. 
whatever version you want to want, it's all the same. They are gobsmacked by what they heard from this particular man. And if you can follow it through in Mark, it's you know, Mark 2.12, Mark 5.20, Mark 5.42, Mark 6.1. It's repetitious, almost to the point of ad nauseum. Amazed, astonished, bewildered. They just couldn't get over it. And again, you come and you take in your mind's eye yourself and that audience you think, I would have been absolutely, over in the kingdom, I will be overwhelmed by what this Lord Jesus Christ will say. I will not believe anybody can put their words together so well. And yet, he did. And he expected to hear, they expected to hear parables that were interesting and could be unwrapped in layers. Now again, if I get on another soapbox, <laughs> I'm sure we've all been along and we've heard exhortations of, about various parables and we've had the, the parables analysed to the nth degree. And you think to yourself sometimes, yeah, well, I can see what Jesus was saying, but this brother, when he's gone this, did, he, did Jesus really mean that parable also to mean that? And I've heard some exposition, for example, of the prodigal son, where I think the other son was far worse than the prodigal son because it suited in that exhortation for that brother to draw that conclusion. I'm not sure I'd agree with it. The point being that parables, though, are very, very catchy and they're very memorable. And people can, as I said, unpack them like an onion, layer upon layer upon layer upon layer. And, of course, the theory was of the Lord Jesus Christ, when they went away from there, they'd be doing exactly that. They'd be thinking, well, he said that, I can understand that. What, what other intent was there in that exhortation or that particular parable? And so, therefore, I think that was, again, something which was brilliant about his preaching. He also, when you went along, he would refute error. And you know, when you have that accusation, accusation about him, oh, well, you're healing because you are doing it in Beelzebub and, you know, prince of devils and so forth. And, and then he, he takes their logic and he says, basically, look at this logic, it's stupid. Forget that word. It just doesn't make any sense. And so succinctly, he just takes it and says, this is why it doesn't make any sense. How could you believe that anyway? And he makes the people who had that made that accusation, accusation of first faith look like a fool, I would suggest, because of his logic, which he was able to apply in such, that, in such a clever, clever way. I've got there. They realised he was very, very, very clever. And I think anybody in that audience would have come to that conclusion. But let's be honest, there are people who like confrontation. And I'm sure there were people who'd go along and would think, oh, this Lord Jesus Christ, or this man Jesus Christ, he was pretty good at refuting the Pharisees. Not about the Sadducees, what about the Rodians and the, the priests? Boy, does he put them in their place. And boy, do they need putting in their place. And so I would imagine there would have been a few in that audience who would have, well, they wouldn't have been, shall we say, upset when the Lord Jesus Christ got stuck in them and their ways. Well, what did they expect to see? We've not talked about what they expected to hear. Well, Jesus was very accessible, wasn't he? No royal trappings, no authority sort of making him distant from the people. He was one of them. And I'd also suggest to you too that there were some things which the Lord Jesus Christ did which might have been meant to be very impressive. A herd of pigs rushing down a hillside and drowning themselves in the sea is pretty visual and pretty impressive. And I think it was meant to be. Raising people on a beer taken outside of a village, it was very visual, it was very open, it was very obvious. It was very, in some ways, confronting for people to see this sort of thing. And therefore, they were looking for these sorts of things and Jesus gave them to them. It also establishes, I think without a question of doubt, his authority and his power. I've also got there the couple of suggestions in relation to they did become a little mercenary didn't, towards the end, didn't they? They expected to be fed in some cases, I'd suggest to you. Fed the 4,000, he fed the 5,000. I wonder what that food was like. The wine he created at the marriage of Cana, Cana 
was superb. What was it like to eat the food of the Lord Jesus Christ? Would you yearn for more? I suggest they did. And again, perhaps they expected to see maybe a little bit of that as well. But there's no doubt about it, the Lord Jesus Christ was accessible to the people in every way. However, Jesus' reaction to the multitude was not always the same, was it? As the crowds got bigger and bigger and bigger, and the suggestion is the reason why in year three those crowds became so large was because it was a sabbatical year. Therefore, people had more time on their hands. And again, perhaps it was the planning of God that that was the intent, that that third year of the Lord Jesus Christ's teaching, that climax of his teaching, was meant to be one where more people could come along because of being a sabbatical year. What would it be like to be followed around 24-7 every time you turned anywhere, any time you went anywhere to be followed? That's what happened, wasn't it, really, in the Lord Jesus Christ's case? And even when he tried to get away, it wasn't really going to work. Mark chapter 6 records, remember when the Lord Jesus Christ sent away the disciples two by two and they went and preached and they came back to him and they were absolutely bubbling with this enthusiasm because they had been received in such a positive way when they taught the word, the gospel, the kingdom of God. And the Lord Jesus Christ wants to get them away and quietly debrief them. And so he suggests a trip across the lake. And when he gets across the other side, what's happened? They found him. And so all the multitude descend on him again. What's the word? He has compassion. Although he needs or wants to spend time with his disciples, he has these people who want to listen. And therefore he just has that compassion. Not always compassion, though. When he comes bound from the Mount of Transfiguration in Mark chapter 9, we read there that there's some frustration. He's been in such a wonderful situation, Elijah and Moses, and he's been, been strengthened by God. And he comes down and there's this squabbling going on with his disciples because they can't heal this boy. And the Lord Jesus Christ does show, I think, there's some frustration because of what has not happened when he was been away. The sadness, the pathos in John chapter 6. When he turns to his disciples, would you also... Why did he say that? Because he told in the earlier verses of John chapter 6 that many followed him no longer. Many of them were disciples no more. They'd had enough. His teaching was too hard. They couldn't make that. They couldn't take that next step which he needed them to take to understand his role as a Messiah of their world. But they just wouldn't make that connection. It's too hard, they walk away. And the Lord Jesus Christ was obviously hurt, personally hurt, by the fact that they walked away and he knew he would never probably see them again because they would never accept him. And then that terrible pathos, when he's coming into Jerusalem and they're all screaming and yelling, Hosanna in the highest. And he turns the Mount of Olives and he sees Jerusalem in front of him and he knows what's going to take place there in a few years' time and he breaks down in tears. Everybody around him is joyous and shouting and lovely things being said. And there is the Lord Jesus Christ crying in their midst because he's looking forward and knowing what's going to happen because this particular reception is so insincere, really. And they really don't understand him for who he is. Being a teacher, we come up with catchphrases. This is one which I came across a few times. It's a good one. The mediocre teacher tells. The good teacher explains. The superior teacher demonstrates. The great teacher inspires. Nice sentiments. We were always told that we were in the pursuit of excellence as teachers. Pursuit of excellence. Well, sometimes we were. But Jesus is an example to every single one of us if we want to teach. Whether it be at Sunday school, whether it be with your grandchildren or your children, 
follow his example. And what is his example? What does the consummate teacher tell you how to teach? Well, I would suggest there are a few things which he's left on record for us. Tell stories that have hidden meanings which challenge to unwrap the story. They're called parables. Speak clearly and with authority. When I was a teacher, we used to have to run through our classes at the end of each semester a uh, questionnaire to find out what they thought of us. Interesting experience, that one. <laughs> uh, what do you think of me as a teacher? And I used to get them back. And one of the things which I always predominated with that questionnaire was one of the questions we quite well. Do you like a teacher who apparently knows his topic? And the answer every time overwhelmingly was yes. They didn't want a question who a teacher who was, well, what do you think? What do you think? Or to break them up into groups and to have discussion about this and that and the other. Because all groups do in a case like that is they just what, what's the expression? They compound ignorance. <laughs> they don't really come to any conclusion. A teacher is there to teach. The Lord Jesus Christ was there to teach. So speak clearly and with authority. Shock people with some examples which you use. Mm, good Samaritan. Not politically correct, was it? In fact, you couldn't have probably been more politically incorrect than to make your hero a Samaritan in Israel. You've got to be joking. And yet... It obviously made it a very, very memorable parable. Craft memorable sayings. You can think of the Lord Jesus Christ. Little catch, catchy, pithy little one-liners. Sufficient on the day is the evil thereof, etc., etc., etc. They're catchy. They're useful. <clears throat> you learn them easily. Ask questions of your audience. Meant to be interaction. In a classroom, we were always told, as a teacher, interact with your students. Well, I'm not interacting with you because you're not really telling me much other than the fact that I can see most of you still got your eyes open, therefore you're still listening. The point being <laughs> that that's what the Lord Jesus Christ did. He expected response and it wasn't just a one way. There wasn't interaction going on. Using visual aids. I suppose the miracles were visual aids, weren't they? Not only that, of course, he was telling the parable of the sower or the parable of the Good Samaritan. Whatever. You know, they were very, shall we say, in that way, visual. Repeat, 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 repeat the most important points in various ways. And that's why I said to you earlier, I think the Lord Jesus Christ, he gave the same speech several times because the audience has needed it. And even if you'd heard it before, the way he spoke, you wanted to get it anyway. So again, repetition is necessary. Create experiences for the listeners. And what's very, 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 in fact, terribly important, practice what you preach. And the Lord Jesus Christ, of course, showed us all that. Lunch is looming. Let me just conclude, if I may, this morning, by having a look at Mark chapter 8. A remarkable piece of scripture in its way. Mark chapter 8, verses 1 to 3. In those days when again a great crowd had gathered and they had nothing to eat, he called his disciples to him and said to them, I have compassion on the crowd because they have been with me now three days and have nothing to eat. And if I send them away, hungry to their homes, they will faint on the way. And some of them have come from far away. Why do I conclude with those verses? What sort of speaker, what sort of orator is it that people will sit and listen for hour after hour after day after day? Through personal deprivation, hunger, with the kids screaming beside them and not want to leave. Because if they left, they might miss something. I would suggest to you that we are getting an insight there into the way the multitude reacted to the Lord Jesus Christ. There was nothing 
at that time, which would separate them from every single word he said. Thank you.